A very warm welcome to all of our guests joining us online and certainly to our guests joining us in the studio. We're coming to you live and direct from the headquarters of the Center for uh, Development and Democracy here in Maputo. My name is Chris Marileng and I'm the Executive Director of Good Governance Africa and I'll be your host uh, for today's webinar. And indeed today's webinar is focusing on a very important matter that affects the people of Mozambique. However, today we'll be focusing on Cabo Delgado specifically and reflecting on the state of the conflict after five years in that country. As most of you who are here joining us live today are aware, this conflict has been going on for about five years now. And it does appear that almost 4,000 lives have been lost as part as this conflict continues to escalate in a way, but definitely continue. What is also certainly uh, unfortunate about this conflict is that it's been it's seen the displacements of tens of thousands of people, not just from Cabo Delgado, but from various provinces uh, up north in Mozambique. Now, one of the key aspects of this conflict is that it's been marked by, I think, an over-focus on a military solution to this crisis. One of the things that we have argued is that as much as a military crisis or rather a military solution can lead to a cessation of hostilities in the short term or at least a pacification of those who are described as violent extremists, it certainly will not result in the grievances that have led or the root causes of this conflict being addressed. So one of the things that we would like to focus on today in this seminar is really what are the drivers of this conflict? Has the military solution worked up north in Cabo Delgado? But more importantly, are there options or is there space for alternative means of resol resolving this crisis in Cabo Delgado? So one of the ways that we have decided to address these pressing concerns and really unpack the questions that face us relating to the conflict in Cabo Delgado is to bring together a panel of seasoned experts in conflict studies who have been researching the situation in Cabo Delgado. We also bring together experts in the field of development, democracy, and certainly governance. Let me talk a bit about the question of governance. The institution that I represent, which is Good Governance Africa, believes that by addressing the root causes of conflict, which stem in many instances from a lack of inclusive governance, and inclusive governance can be defined as that process that determines who gets what, when, and how, and whether this process of determining the authoritative allocation of resources is focused on the citizen or simply on possibly political elites and commercial elites can really be moved in a direction that leads to more inclusive systems of governance that are centered at really addressing these underlying grievances. So the, the panel that we are going to be bringing together to discuss this, uh, I'll begin to introduce just now after I give you a sense of the way in which the format of this conversation will occur. We'll allow our panelists 10 minutes to really introduce their perspective on the conflict in uh, Cabo Delgado. This will be followed by a question and answer session. And we're asking on our uh, studio guests and certainly those who are joining us online to also chip in with questions that help us unpack this question. So joining me and to my immediate left is Professor Adriano Navunga, who is certainly our host today. And he's the executive director from the Center for Democratic Development in Mozambique, the CDD. Thank you uh, for having us here today. We also have uh, here in our studio at the CDD, Professor Antoni Fanieke. He's from the Tabo Mbeki School of Governance at UNISA in South Africa. Thank you for joining us. And joining us online, we have Professor Joao Fijoao, who is the research coordinator uh, for CMR. And finally, or last but not least, is Piers uh, Pigot, who is the Southern Africa Project Director 
at the Institute for Security Studies. Let me start off with you, Professor Navunga. Just give us, uh, to begin with, what your assessment of the situation is in Cabo Delgado. Thank you very much, uh, Chris. Uh, uh, good afternoon to everyone, uh, those who are joining uh, in person and those who are joining us um, uh, virtually. Um, and Happy New Year, uh, all of you. Huh? Um, we have just uh, started um, with uh, activities, uh, most of us uh, from the civil society um, uh, spectrum. The, uh, the situation in Cabo Delgado I think it is. Uh, it can be described as moving into um, a forgotten conflict, a forgotten, um, but a disastrous uh, conflict. Uh, forgotten in the sense that most of our um, participants today will recall that we have been um, uh, busy. Um, first at the beginning to um, advocate the government to look at the conflict as a serious matter. Uh, at the beginning, government um, was looking at the conflict as um, an activity of a banditry um, um, uh, people somewhere uh, in the north. Then they evolved into a situation of saying uh, this is an um, uh, aggression from uh, outside. So I've been pushing for the government, first of all, to look at the conflict um, seriously. Uh, number two, to uh, following major attacks in 2021 uh, for the government to seek uh, international support. It was evident that domestically, uh, both governance and um, the military response uh, was not added to repeal the activity of violent extremists. Uh, we're successful there in uh, internationalizing the conflict and also in um, having the government to seek support uh, from, uh, uh, from SADAC, from SAMIM, and also uh, from the Rwandese. With that said, and that um, in place, we uh, also been successful in uh, having the government to uh, establish a DIN, um, the um, Northern Mozambique Integrated Development Agency. Um, but uh, though that was a, a positive move, um, at a policy level um, um, and a more programming and a governance level, um, I think um, uh, that was not satisfactory um, uh, in a couple of dimensions, uh, including um, that uh, at the moment, as it is, there is no, um, uh, from a policy level, um, government um, has not officially uh, acknowledged the governance failure in Cabo Delgado and in northern Mozambique as one of the key drivers of the conflict. Government is still very much in the perspective of an international, um, uh, an international, uh, internationally driven uh, sort of conflict. Um, um, in our understanding, um, there are, of course, international elements, but the core of this conflict is a governance failure, uh, starting from uh, the lack of a peace dividend from the 1992 uh, peace agreement, uh, moving on to uh, an elite-centric extractivism uh, with gross violation of human rights, but importantly, um, uh, an, uh, a situation where the interests and the aspirations of local communities in northern Mozambique are not being taken care of from the uh, governance uh, model of the extractivism that is ongoing. So this is an important aspect. And although Adin is there, but uh, there is no an official document which acknowledges these aspects 
and tasking a dean to uh, serious and thoroughly look at them. So this is an important uh, uh, aspect. So uh, to your question as to how is the situation, although the international forces uh, with all the challenges, including uh, not adequate um, military coordination, uh, which could, on the one hand, um, uh, enable um, a military accountability. Military accountability. Uh, look at what happened recently with the banning of bodies um, without an adequate response to what happened. And that is clearly crime, but there's no infrastructure to engage uh, the military. Uh, but secondly, um, a framework which would enable a verifiable improvement of military capacity from the Mozambican side. That is not uh, that is not yet there. But one has to acknowledge that the military intervention from um, the region um, it has. Uh, in the sense that, um, um, on the one hand, um, Montepoich, no Musimbo da Praia, sorry, which was the, the, the district that was under the control of the violent extremists, uh, but also the capacity of the violent extremists to um, attack and occupy significant parts of the territory that has been seriously. Uh, thwarted. So one can say that um, that uh, the intervention has been successful. What happened uh, is that there has been a, a significant lack of um, uh, proper governance response to that new space. Uh, Adin was there, um, but a bit white elephant as it is at the moment. Um, uh, in the ground, in the districts, not much is happening. Uh, government is pushing for uh, IDPs to return. Um, some of the uh, IDPs, they are returning because uh, they are facing hunger in the um, IDP camps. They are not returning because it is safe up there uh, to return. Um, so, um, from a substantive viewpoint, uh, there have been significant failures aiming at um, um, stabilizing um, uh, Cabo Delgado, though the improvements that were made uh, uh, militarily. Uh, Prof, let, let, let me just ask you, be, be, before you hand over the mic, a, a couple of issues. You, you, you describe this as a, a forgotten conflict, and you also indicate that there are some underlying grievances, which also seem to be forgotten. Tell us a bit about what those grievances are for the local communities. Um, uh, again, conceptually, by a forgotten conflict, uh, I mean um, uh, the fact that uh, from the top, uh, leadership in Mozambique. Uh, it seems to be focusing on other uh, uh, aspects of uh, political governance and less um, uh, uh, on, uh, on the conflict. There's been significant push from the top um, in order to have uh, uh, to meet the basic, the basic requirements um, um, demanded by the uh, international private sector to resume activities we have been uh, we have seen significant moves there mm -hmm. uh, but from the perspective of um, a multi-stakeholder engagement for conflict resolution we have not seen um, um, anything meaningful uh, happening there so tell us a bit about those grievances what yes. what, what, what do you mean by grievances uh, by grievances, we mean, um, uh, number one, that from a historical perspective, historical perspective, I mean, they have, uh, they have been, um, if you come look at what is happening in the coast and versus the more uh, interland, um, uh, one can clearly see that there is an ethnicity aspect here, 
which um, uh, since independence has been uh, unofficially used uh, for exclusion, for marginalization. Um, uh, and because of, of that, uh, the, during the Civil War, um, there have been lines of the Civil War uh, with some of the areas uh, supporting, uh, uh, at the time, the, uh, the rebel movement, which then resulted in um, uh, negating uh, the post-1992 the, um, peace dividend, which again resulted in denying uh, state capacity in some of those areas, and hence um, being vulnerable uh, for uh, attack. Let me give an example here of uh, Musimbo the Prime, uh, which uh, uh, it is so, it's the first secondary school to be built in 2007. This was three years prior to the discovery of world class gas reserves. Uh, and those reserves, in order to go there, you have to pass uh, this region. So, uh, some of these aspects, um, let alone the, uh, the, the the exploration of other mineral resources, which, as I have indicated, um, it is elite centric dominated. By elite centric dominated, I mean one thing. I, I mean uh, the leaders of this country, the leaders of these countries, they have access to information, they have access to influence, they have access to power. They use that to. Um, uh, tech land, they use that to control uh, minerals, uh, including uh, illegal logging, etc. And in so doing, they, uh, all this wealth is not contributing into the development of the state capacity, which would result in uh, um, existing resources to be widely distributed among the ordinary citizens. But there is also another aspect which is the, uh, if you look at one particular sector in this country, the private security, the private uh, militarized security is dominated by those who control the state. And some of the state capacity, it ends up being utilized by those who are tasked by the constitution to protect the sovereignty of the state. And, and so some of these issues, they turn Cabo Delgado into uh, a place where uh, uh, governance is not leading into uh, the ordinary people uh, meet, their, meet the basic services. The state um, is being uh, used by those who are in the positions um, uh, of power uh, and not for the benefit of the people, but for the, um, their own private benefit. Let me hold you here, Prof Nuvunga, because I think this is a good place to bring in, uh, joining us online, is Professor Joao Fejoao, um, who in the past is also, in the work that he has done, mentioned how some of the drivers of conflict can really be found from the local develop uh, sort of local dynamics around development, and I think it would be good for us to uh, bring you into the conversation here, uh, Prof uh, Fajral. Prof, are you with us? Uh, maybe you can. Yes. Uh, now. Uh, yes, sir, I am. Uh, thank you for the for the invitation. Um, I would like to share with you. Uh, some uh, some presentation that I made in PowerPoint, but it's the first time that I'm using uh, this this platform. So let me give me just one minute. I think. Can you see my presentation? Uh, not 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 yet. We can't see your presentation yet, but it's loading up. So while while, while it's loading, it may be. Um, I can ask you a direct question. Oh, here's here's your uh, presentation. So go ahead, uh, Prof. Thank you. Thank you very much. Um, I was invited uh, to make this presentation, and, and I thank very much uh, to to CDD. 
Um, the, the subject that I was invited to speak about was about uh, the possibility for dialogue in Cabo Delgado. And I was uh, wondering this morning, um, when we speak about dialogue, we speak about dialogue between who? Uh, so is it, a, is it between the ruling party? Is it between the government and the non-state armed groups, as, they, as normally we used to call them? Uh, between the government and civil society organizations, between the multinational companies and the affected companies uh, and the affected communities, or among the population. So um, I would like to give you some brief remarks about these um, different uh, uh, dialogue possibilities. But before, I would like to give an historic historical context of, of dialogue in Mozambique. Mozambique um, would be could be a good case study for to analyze the the lack of dialogue how to how to build a society without dialogue so if we look to the history of mozambique during the last 100 years it's this it's the history of violence the during the colonial and fascist regime with the, with forced labor and forced crops and so on then forcing the liberation struggle, also violence. And then one party system with a very political uh, violent regime that caused uh, a civil war. It was an aggression war, but it was also, it, it, it became also a, a civil war. And then in 1919, for the first time, we had a, a new constitution that allowed the freedom of association, of expression, of press and so on. But in this uh, new millennium, we saw again the violent penetration of extractive industry situations of land grabbing, and now an, a war in 2017. So, returning to this is a, just to, an introduction to contextualize that the word dialogue. Uh, it's difficult to find in the Mozambican dictionary since the colonial period. So it affects the 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 the, the, the relations of. Uh, um, in the um, in the in the north of Cabo Delgado nowadays. So starting from the dialogue inside the ruling party, we are facing a lack of the on the drivers of the Yeah, now it seems to be better. So we are facing a lack of debate on what are the drivers of the conflict and what structural reforms we would need, as Professor Nuvunga spoke about. There is still this illusion that we can return to 2016 as nothing happened. Um, and the main debate is still on the new leader should be from the north, from the center, or from the south. Now it's our time to, to rule. Should we, is there a space for a third mandate? This gaboos and use tension. So no uh, deep dialogue about the causes of the conflict. The second um, uh, axle of dialogue that we should talk about is between the possibility of dialogue between the government and non-state armed groups. As Novunga, Professor Novunga already uh, explained, the government official speech moved from the de denial of the situation uh, to a discourse of there is a faceless enemy, we don't know what they want and we, don't, we, we would like to communicate, but we don't know how, to a new uh, perspective that um, uh, uh, these amnesties and, okay, return to, com to, to the communities and you'll be uh, forgiven. From the, the Mashababus, the non-state armed groups, um, there is no uh, uh, evidence of negotiation uh, uh, with Felimu, who are called the Kafirs and the pigs and so on. So these contribute to a vicious cycle of, of violence. The third, uh, the third uh, point that I would like to talk about is, the, is about the dialogue between the government and civil society organizations. So civil society organizations are facing a lot of problems related with the access of, to, to information, to education, training, media, laws, difficulties, financing, financial difficulties related 
to access of uh, logistic uh, um, transport to the, to the areas um, of the affected communities um, in a scenario of poverty, a lot of bureaucratic obstacles to legalize the, the civil society organization mixed with a lot of internal problems related with the patrimonialistic and corruption uh, society inside the civil society organizations as well. Um, it, it, uh, the, the interaction between the uh, civil society organization and the government is not easy many times. It's very politicized, uh, is um, marked by the authoritarianism of the government and and, and their intolerance and, and their intolerance and especially after the beginning of the armed conflict the um, the role of civil society organization was was very difficult because people was spread on uh, on the province without access um, to means of survivance um, and very affected uh, by the war what are the alternatives use of informal channels social media, uh, Facebook, um, uh, WhatsApp, uh, uh, places of, or football games, places where especially the youngs can um, uh, give their protests but without any impact. And of course, violence becomes to be understood as um, the, poss the only possibility of social participation. The dialogue between the multinationals, multinational companies and the affected um, uh, communities um, in the present, uh, so we, we are facing uh, uh, an effort of Total Energy to stabilize um, the region. Um, there is all this uh, corporate communication from these companies that try to disguise local tension, some social responsibility and local content initiative um, as happening, but they have been ineffective to generate structural transformation in the north of, of the country. Uh, what is going to be after the fourth, the fourth major? We have, uh, when total energy return, we have a traumatized um, and a capitalized and unskilled local population, which uh, who will um, um, receive thousands of workers who arrive uh, in the province, um, much more competitive. Uh, it will generate an employment, more inequalities and social conflicts. It was one of the main driver of this conflict, the feeling of lack of protection from the population and then uh, revolt. Among the population, we have these mixed feelings. We have this Pamoja to Nawez, the slogan, created by Total, together we can, it's a, it's a classic uh, slogan that we, we see similar slogans like this, we saw like this in, in, in Afghanistan, we saw, we saw slogans like this in other places um, in the world. Um, there are some initiative for social cohesion involving civil society organization like MASC, religious uh, organization, Total Energies is also financing some of these initiatives. Um, there is this resilience and the willingness of population to return to normal life, but at the same time, there is a collective distrust. Deep resentments and distrust among the population and the many stories of violence and revenge circulating in social media, in videos that, um, that are uh, very, very cruel. Uh, and, and, uh, but we receive it in, in our WhatsApps. And then there is an, a, a new uh, possibility of dialogue between the West and the multinational companies and the non-state army groups and ISIS. Um, but I will not develop this issue. I just leave it for, uh, for your reflection. And uh, thank you very much.
trial for that, that uh, very in-depth presentation on the possibilities of dialogue. One of the things that we haven't sort of received from your presentation is which form of dialogue are six that you present. I'm sorry, I'm not uh, uh, hearing anything. I'm not receiving the sound. Maybe I can. 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 Maybe let me let me sort of jump to you, uh, Prof. Yeah. <laughs> um, let's 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 have a, a, a discussion here, yeah. and maybe others will, will jump in and join us. Maybe you can give us your uh, sort of reflection of uh, this discussion, but also what you think about the state of conflict in in Cabo Verde. I speak into this thing. And where do I look? 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 Can I look at the camera? Look at the camera. 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 Look at the the civil war, as some people call it. Uh, and I think, and I um, think um, upon the reflection, upon the reflection I haven't worked this work in my head, but the, the way that it's processed is to if we want to bring the conflict to an end, uh, then Zhao's presentation, those six possibilities, and an amalgamation of some of them, Minutes, but I, I quickly want to say that um, two, two conclusions that I can The first one is that violent extremism was a very popular term or concept, not only for. Powerful, powerful voices, voices who talk about terrorism. About terrorism. In fact, in fact, in fact Sadek is on, on, a, on a knife's on edge. They talk about violent extremism, but more and more they choose the other way, terrorism. So is that a description of what's going on here? Do we declare Cabo del Cabo a ISIS? And how to prevent, how to prevent, prevent uh, and, and counter violent extremism and keep, keep that alive. Some notes Some on that. Notes on that. Uh, the second yeah. one the second is, one you is, started off by saying, saying what uh, 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 I wanted to reflect on, on the meaning of, um, of the concept that concept we use or the definition of politics. Who gets what, when, how, that distribution. Uh, and with it goes with the government. Somebody wrote this out there. Politics. Politics. Action. 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 Art of looking for trouble. Finding it everywhere. Diagnosing it. And applying the wrong remedy. And this speaks 
to the inability of our political class or our ruling class in Southern Africa to actually correctly identify what is going on. We can't do that proper analysis. Then in its in its Okay, so, okay, so with those so out of the way, way let me share, let me share uh, fairly quickly with you um, the um, key findings uh, that uh, a research uh, team uh, came up with uh, consisting of uh, academics from the Southern African region, including uh, colleagues from the Center for International and Strategic Studies, uh, CEEI, at the uh, Shisano University, colleagues of yours, um, and working with the Friedrich Ebert Stiftung. Um, the first thing we wanted to do was to reflect as a group of researchers on whether the focus on a military solution is appropriate, proper, and will take us to, to peace. And we thought, no, we needed a broader discourse than counterterrorism uh, or military force. Uh, and indeed, we have to suggest some policy changes if indeed the region wants to move forward. And so some of the key findings. Uh, first, first on, on the drivers of violent extremism in, in Southern Africa. So I'm taking a step back for now from Cabo Delgado and I'm looking at a slightly broader perspective. Um, you've heard this before. We must understand the structural factors that underlie violence, underlying violence. You've mentioned this earlier. Uh, and I think many academics make this point. Structural factors include state fragility, poor governance, political and social marginalization, youth marginalization, as well as pre predatory global economics. Um, and then governments, I, and let me formulate this sentence carefully, <laughs> diplomatically, governments play a significant role in the emergence of violent extremism by designing and arbitrating over the physical, social and political conditions which produce certain behavioral outcomes within human populations. Uh, governments can, governments can, can enhance or reduce the prospects for violent extremism, and they can block, sabotage, avoid, counter solutions that are homegrown and bottom-up. And the reason for that is not difficult to work out. Politicians are in the game of control and, and in our region increasingly self interest so there's the first problem. Um, we found a strong link between transnational organized crime and, uh, and corruption, with organized crime syndicates relying on corruption, usually within government, but also within the private sector, to diminish risk or facilitate their, their operations. And so we find that uh, violent extremist organizations engage in illicit trade activities and or interact with transnational crime syndicates to sustain their operations. In our publication, there is a whole chapter on how that looks like here in Mozambique, but also in Southern Africa. Um, uh, there are UN agencies which produce very detailed maps of the flow of illegal goods and services that comes through parts of Mozambique. Uh, South Africa tracks a lot of this Gauteng. And it gets re repackaged and re export to Europe and elsewhere. We need to understand what is the meaning of that if we don't co collaborate and coordinate across borders to take charge of this, we, we won't win. The same with uh, rhino and elephant and uh, wildlife poaching and so on. Um, <clears throat> there are interesting trends, um, Chair, uh, within, with the, the recruitment and the radicalization of African youth into violent extremist organizations. And, and uh, if you study Al-Shabaab uh, in Somalia and Kenya, then you will realize that attracting disillusioned youth into your uh, ideology and your mode of operation is increasingly sophisticated because those who do this make use of the social media and in particular I've learned Facebook, TikTok, it's not an innocent tool anymore, WhatsApp, and then of course websites. And in fact, those who are at the receiving end of violent extremism in Somalia or elsewhere in Nigeria often face uh, extremists who make stories, videos of 
how they attack compounds and how they take out soldiers. And it's, it's sophisticated production, uh, better than this. It comes with sound and, and all the drama and the flag and the music uh, uh, behind it. Um, the, the next part we examined was to better understand how African governments and institutions, for example, SADC or ECOWAS or AU, actually respond to the scourge. And the story there is not very good because we now know that, uh, that governments need to develop national action plans that's, uh, and implement them. Um, and African governments have made very little progress with designing and implementing national action plans. Um, uh, when I wrote this uh, a while ago, I, um, our research found that there was no NAP on VE. There was no national action plan on violent extremism here in Mozambique. I might be wrong. Maybe there is one now. There were some moves, uh, discussions uh, with specific actors, including the Ministry of Defense. But uh, you can educate me later whether this is actually taking off or not. Um, we also asked the question whether the AU's African Peace and Security Architecture, APSA, is optimally designed to deal with this new threat of violent extremism. And the answer is no. Uh, in fact, one of the recommendations we make is that we have to revisit the architecture of peace and security make at the level of the AU and how it spills over into the RECs, the regional economic communities. Because we're not designed to understand. These things are not designed to comprehend and respond to the new threats and our increasingly volatile international environment. Um, if we come to this, the, the Mozambican response, I'll try and keep it short. Um, it, it looks to us as if the government's strategies for addressing violent extremism have moved from prevention or avoidance to countering terrorism. CT is the name of the game. And maybe some of their partners inspire the approach. Um, and moreover, the government in collaboration with, with uh, partners have, have adopted measures to prevent the youth from being involved in, in violent extremism and terrorist activities. But it looks to us as if these initiatives are largely uh, adopted from elsewhere in Africa and I don't have, we don't have time to go into what's happening in Nigeria, but we can tell the story, Nigeria, Somalia, these initiatives do not work very well. Uh, what about SAMIM? Is SAMIM designed to make a difference? Is it appropriate? And do they understand what they face? Uh, again, uh, uh, we, we, we found that um, there are severe challenges to, uh, the, to the SADC initiative. Uh, SAMI must operate with Rwanda uh, in this more or less the same space with the Mozambican armed security sector, if I'm broader than just the military. And uh, if you listen to uh, uh, Professor Molomo, who is the civilian uh, commander of SAMI, there are communication and coordination and collaboration challenges. Let me, let me put it as broad as that. Um, so so that, is, that, is, that is problematic. Um, there's a section here which I won't go into detail because we were wondering, some of us were wondering, is there a gender dimension to violent extremism? And maybe the audience in our discussion can, can pick this up again. Uh, and, and, and we think that uh, women are not only victims of violence, they're also enablers or protectors or uh, 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 assistants. Uh, they can either work with a local uh, police uh, a, a community, a forum, in, in helping to identify where the problems are, or they can play a very protective role uh, in terms of violent extremists and the cr criminal syndicates, enablers, so to speak. Some recommendations out of all of this. You must read the book. I will, I will <laughs> send it to all of you <laughs> when you ask. It's uh, if he is as uh, sponsoring it, it'll be an online thing. Um, what what can the Mozambican government and society do? What can SADC do? Is there a role for the AU at all? And what do we tell the these international the the ICPs, the international cooperating partners, the donors? What do we tell them? What do we want from them? Uh, and and what do they give us that is valuable? So so there's a section there. If I can 
maybe one minute. Yeah. Okay. So, so on the Mozambican government and society, we, we think uh, uh, that they should work together to develop homegrown national and local strategies on preventing and countering violent extremism, uh, considering local realities and history. And these strategies should be comprehensive. It's a tall order. By incorporating measures to prevent and counter threats emanating from recruitment, radicalization, as well as de-radicalization. And it should formalize the economy in, in northern Mozambique to make it less susceptible to exploitation by both criminal and violent extremist groups, and you might as well add private sector. It should complement military intervention with a well-defined and coordinated long and short-term investment in human security. But you did mention Aden and the problems there. Um, <clears throat> it should also think about a reintegration program. I, I think Mozambicans must tell us what they've learned from their own history in making peace, so that perhaps we apply some of those lessons to Cabo Delgado when the time is right. Is there a place for Southern Africa to do anything beyond summing, you know, deploying soldiers, which is not enough? Um, <clears throat> well, I, I think we should make sure that our, our governments respect and promote economic, social, cultural, environmental, civil, and political rights of our citizens as fundamental in preventing and countering violent extremism. When citizens, when these rights are violated, they become frustrated. If there's no solution or relief, they become radical. And that can easily turn into violence if they are attracted by enablers. Um, <clears throat> and there's a sentence here which I think you will find um, um, funny, but it's where we are now. Our governments in the region, working with civil society, should establish strong moral leadership and rigorous anti-corruption oversight mechanisms. We don't have that. We pay lip service to this. And, and let me put it in another way, provocative. If we don't have strong moral leadership and effective anti-corruption measures, where will we go as societies? Yeah. Um, there's a section on, on how to use legal instruments, but also psychology to prevent radicalization and to promote de-radicalization. De there's work to be done. And I'm so, sometimes angry that our governments are not doing enough homework to zoom into these issues that, that I'm discussing here. They leave it to some academics, and when the academics publish, they don't read or they don't listen. I don't know if uh, some of these policymakers are on the screen, but uh, <laughs> this, is, this is... And so then, maybe finally, uh, if I can abandon my notes. Uh, so SADC understands the threats. They have regular summits. There was one a few days ago, uh, where they worried, where they said that they're concerned about Eswatini. They were happy about Lesotho. And they're asking the member states to contribute more to Samim. Remember the communique. What the communique doesn't say is that some of us have recommended to SADC, why don't you create a, a, a preventing and countering of violent extremism capacity in the organization? Because Cabo Delgado might spill over. I mean, here's Tanzania, uh, Malawi is close by. We know South Africa has cells and all the rest of this. So in, in response to that, they created a counterterrorism unit. W where does that take you? And then uh, when the academics engage, they say they are very busy with their own plans. I, I'm making a plea now that, uh, and, and I, I hope you will believe me if I say this, we have intellectual capital resources and the ability to analyze what is happening in our region. Us Africans can do that. We don't have to hire consultants from Europe or from America to come and tell us what is wrong with us. We know exactly what the game is. And this is a plea for a stronger collaboration between think tanks, academics, universities, throughout the region and decision makers, because I know that the decision makers in SADC, they need this. They don't have this. They need this. 
They will pick up any solution that is presented by a partner. And then five years later, it backfires on us. So let me end on that um, dramatic note. <laughs> what a dramatic note. Ex excellent. And let, let, let me follow up with this question. You, you sort of ponder in your presentation on how do governments and uh, AU, SADC respond uh, to issues of violent extremism. And then you kind of respond and you say one of the ways is to develop national response plans. We heard earlier on uh, our, our colleague, uh, Professor Joao, saying that there were six possible forms of, of dialogue. And unfortunately, he dropped off. And I know we, we, we didn't have time to interrogate his, his six possible forms of dialogue. Given your response and the development of what you about national response sort of plans, does dialogue feature in them? And is it limited only to state actors? Uh, it's for you. Yeah. <laughs> I don't know why I'm on the spotlight. Uh, I'm sorry, because uh, our colleague uh, dropped off. Yeah, and, and raised the idea of national response plans. Yeah. And PSP Go, is he coming back? Uh, he, he's going to be on, I'm sure. We'll, we'll try. All right. Yes. Yes. Uh, let me put it short and sharp. Yeah. Let me start provocatively by saying, how do you think Ukraine will end? The Dutch Prime Minister, bless him, said on CNN a week ago, we will give Ukraine everything they want until Ukraine wins and the Russians lose the war. If uh, I take the Dutch prime minister's position as a NATO position, it, it means that the violent conflict in Europe, that war will continue until there's little left in that part of, of Europe. And it, and it conjures up a specter of weapons of mass destruction. I was bitterly disappointed to hear the extent to which NATO is prepared to, to go. At some point, even if this happens, this scenario, at some point, there's got to be a, 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 a resolution of the conflict in Ukraine, in Eastern Europe. At some point, the Europeans must make peace with the Russians or the Russians with the Europeans. At some point, not now. So is, is, the, is the conflict ripe for resolution? Is it, and now we come to Cabo de Guado. I don't think it is. I think two things need to happen. We, who want to see peace and development in Mozambique, in Southern Africa, must be confident that we have the tools to negotiate, to talk, to dialogue. And what academics can do, and what we are busy doing, is we're capacitating, educating, training officials and civil society to use the tools, the language, the insight to actually enter into a dialogue. Not a shouting match or a screaming match or how, not a political game, something else. At the same time, again, rather controversially, on the other side, those who might be exhausted two, five or ten years from now, would they have the capacity to speak in a language that we understand and that will enable us to put the beginnings of a negotiated settlement on the table. This is controversial. If they don't have it, shouldn't we give them some tools so that when they speak, we hear them loud and clear. If they talk nonsense, we react. But if they express a desire for some kind of negotiated outcome, let's hear them. Not now, not now, but when the time is right. Just that I understand that uh, Professor Joao is, 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 is back with us. Prof uh, Joao online, I, I hope you've been following the conversation. Yeah. Um, you dropped off for a second. One of the things that you were pondering about here was the prospects of some kind of negotiated settlement, dialogue, whatever you might call it. Um, my direct question to you is of the six uh, potential dialogues that you expressed to us, which one, in your view, has the highest chance of succeeding in Cabo Delgado? Um, 
Well, um, let me first of all um, explain that this conflict uh, is very complex, as everybody already know. Uh, it has multiple uh, causes. And of course, the internal aspects are very important related uh, with the um, economical, um, um, economical uh, inequalities, uh, related with the social and ethnic tensions, uh, related with social exclusion, related to lack of access um, uh, to justice, uh, re um, uh, um, resulting from uh, the lack of presence of the state in, in terms of providing uh, public services and the feeling of state against the people that is very common um, in the north of Mozambique in general since the early 20th century. So this is a very old feeling since the capital move from Mozambique and Ireland to, to Maputo. Uh, of, of course, there are all these internal aspects, but I believe this conflict has to be understood in the context of the political economy of the region, not only there. Uh, not only in Cabo Delgado, so it involves all these part of the world, all these Mozambican channel, who was um, designed to be a corridor and a source of raw materials for the Western, uh, for, for the global market. So, uh, ship uh, 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 raw materials for the global market. So we have the Mozambican channel. Um, that has several corridors, the Nakala corridor, Baira corridor, Maputo corridor, the Lishinga corridor, and they were designing to serve the capitalist industry of other countries, not Mozambique. So um, this uh, extractive and extroverted, uh, extroverted, I don't know if this word exists in English, I mean, um, uh, to extract raw materials for to export for the international markets it's something that doesn't promote doesn't provoke development uh, doesn't provide jobs uh, doesn't integrate the local markets is not uh, uh, good for the national union for for, for the construction of the nation states um, so uh, I think um, there are many international interests behind this. Also, I believe that internal factors are very important. I am not naive and I recognize that there are other external factors that I don't have so much information to talk about them in public. Of course, I could speak about them public, uh, privately, but not in public because I don't have enough tools to understand it, enough evidence to understand it but i would say that other neighbor countries like tanzania has advantage with, with this situation i would say that some gulf countries have advantage with this situation i would say that for somehow this situation was good for the penetration of capital because it decreased uh, uh, the capacity of mozambique to negotiate uh, so uh, it's very interesting for the international capital to make the uh, Mozambican state weak in order to, to better negotiate. And it's evident that there is a war between the West and ISIS. Uh, and Mozambique is now uh, the stage where this uh, war also is happening. So th th this is very complex. I I'm not uh, reproducing the, um, uh, the, the slogan of the external hands. That's not what I'm saying at all. I am just also recognizing that this element also exists and it's too complicated, but we have to consider that. Um, yeah. Uh, may, maybe this is a good time for us to bring in 
uh, Piers uh, Pigot, um, who's joining us, I, I understand, from uh, Johannesburg. Uh, Piers, I hope you've been following uh, the conversation. I know we've had some challenges with, with our connection. Uh, you've heard basically a context being painted uh, by Professor Adriano. Uh, then, uh, furthermore, we, we, we've developed that context into possible solutions, um, suggestions of dialogue uh, by Professor Joao. Uh, Professor Antoni has even gone further than that with a more radical approach, which says that we, we need to capacitate and create a capable state which deals with these aspects beyond uh, the region where we see the conflict. Mm -hmm. I know you've been focusing on issues especially related to the security situation. Maybe you can give us or start by uh, uh, giving us an update into how you see the security situation unfolding up in northern Mozambique. Uh, thank you, Chris, and, and, and thanks very much to the organizers for the opportunity to, to uh, uh, contribute in this discussion. Uh, yeah, I mean, I think, first of all, it's important to reflect on the limitations of uh, information about the security situation coming out of Cabo Delgado, and that we are reliant on a, uh, a host of different sources, often single source, copy to try and map uh, uh, what is going on on a day-to-day -day and a weekly basis. And, and you will have seen the work, uh, uh, the sterling work of colleagues at uh, uh, ACLED with the Cabo Ligado project and, and other actors, uh, civil society actors in particular, and media elements uh, in Mozambique uh, that have been trying to set out what the challenges are. Sadly, we have only sporadic and limited information uh, about the, the conflict itself from state actors uh, and from foreign intervention forces. Uh, and this tends to lend to a narrative that suggests that there is a, um, a winning narrative or a winning uh, uh, strategy in play uh, and that uh, uh, the insurgent capacity is being uh, eroded and that, that uh, the insurgents are ultimately going to lose uh, in the context of a hard security strategy. Now, obviously, since the intervention uh, of, and I hope I'm, I'm hearing a little feedback, so I hope you can still hear me. Uh, since the intervention of foreign forces in the middle of 2021, certainly the security situation has changed significantly. The foreign uh, forces were given different areas of responsibility as we've heard, and there has been a consolidation of security in the areas of, of Rwandan responsibility, uh, particularly in, in uh, Palmer and and similar to prior around the urban areas, some insecurity in some outlying areas of those districts, but largely a massive downtick in the number of violent incidents in those areas. And we've seen these have been the main locations for uh, the return of IDPs as well. Although the IDP situation remains very complex and varied from uh, location to location, which indeed is a, a reflection of the security situation itself. Initially, we saw this conflict uh, focused on, on eight districts, uh, essentially, and, and five in particular uh, of the 17 districts of Cabo Delgado. Since the intervention, however, we've seen incidents in 16 of the 17 districts, which reflects in some ways, uh, and they, they're not necessarily sustained in all of these districts, but we've seen the spread of violent incidents uh, uh, across the entire province, and of course, with uh, some movements into Niasa in late 2021, uh, and then last year, two southern offensives into the southern districts of Cabo Delgado and, and also uh, some interventions in, in uh, Nampula. Uh, this has generated this has generated a major security challenge uh, in the southern districts, uh, and we've seen since then in late November, early December, uh, an expansion of Rwandan forces uh, and an extension to the southern district of Ankwabi as an official area of responsibility, which, uh, as my colleague at ISS, Borges Namiria, has written in a piece that came out yesterday, uh, seems to reflect a further extension of 
uh, Rwanda's primary focus to defend key uh, economic interests uh, in Cabo Delgado. Uh, we also know that their position helped strengthen the main uh, road artery running from Pemba north to Makomia, the N380, which has been a, uh, an area of, 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 of concern uh, during those southern offensives. And we know also north of, of the town of Makomia, uh, towards Midumbi, uh, there's been ongoing concerns there. The conflict has essentially been uh, focused in, in the districts of uh, Makomia, Midumbi, uh, Nangadi, and interestingly enough, in terms of, of uh, claims by Islamic State, and I'll come back to them in a moment, and Kwabi, a major uh, area of, of, of claims there in terms of incidents in the second half of last year. Uh, so the security situation is, is, is particularly fluid. Uh, the pacification uh, in Cabo Delgado, sorry, in, in Mosimbo de Praia and Palma led to a significant displacement of uh, insurgents uh, into areas largely of salmon responsibility. Uh, interestingly, the, the, the narrative of effective, efficient Rwandan operations, which certainly there is, is, is uh, some evidence of, of, of that, uh, has contributed to this notion of, of a winning uh, narrative that the government of Mozambique promotes, but also interestingly into a uh, a somewhat unhelpful comparative narrative of, of uh, salmon uh, limitations in terms of its operations. And certainly salmon uh, has struggled uh, in some respects. I think it's clear to say that the salmon force is not fit for purpose in terms of, of counterinsurgency uh, options. It doesn't have adequate long range reconnaissance and supply capacity, and certainly. Uh, as we've seen more broadly in Cabo Delgado, there is a limitation of, of rotary and fixed wing air assets, which are essential uh, for uh, operating in this kind of environment. I think, uh, uh, so what we have seen is an effective containment in certain parts of the province, uh, but we still see uh, uh, operational freedom for insurgents that have split into smaller groupings uh, in, in these districts. Uh, and have been able to pick off and attack uh, outlying areas of, of, of those districts, uh, including attacks on, on uh, mainly Mozambican security force members and uh, for, for resupply of ammunition and weapons. Uh, so their capacity to, to uh, terrorize and, at and, and, and attack remains. They've also attacked, in some instances, Rwandan forces, but also ambushed Salmon forces, and we've seen the use of rudimentary uh, IEDs, uh, which uh, may be a game changer if, if, if their capacity to uh, enhance and develop that tactic further uh, comes into play. And we do know from materials that have been recovered from, uh, I, uh, from uh, insurgent camps that there have been certainly attempts uh, to build their, their, their competency around uh, the use of, of, of such uh, such weaponry. So, you know, this this leads me to look at what's the role of IS in all of this. And I'm very conscious of what Joao said about not feeding the external uh, narrative in terms of responsibilities for what's going on, because it's in a which uh, the Islamic State franchise uh, is attempted to take uh, advantage. We have seen since the uh, Oath of Allegiance back in July, sorry, back in, in April, March, April 2019, we saw a slow drip of, of, of claims made by Islamic State uh, for a selection of incidents, uh, certainly a smaller number uh, than, than the total, a uh, small proportion of that. But what we have seen over the last seven months, and particularly since May the 8th, when Islamic State allocated Mozambique its own provincial status, a very significant uptick in the number of claims by Islamic State to incidents uh, uh, of violence in, in Mozambique. In fact, it's over 125 claims uh, in the last seven months, uh, which outstrips the total number of claims in the previous uh, three years before that. Uh, and this is uh, being done in a way which uh, is uh, linked to 
uh, IS formatting and, and messaging much more consistent with what we see in other uh, provinces of, of Islamic State. Now, uh, that in, in enhanced coherence uh, does not necessarily uh, translate into uh, in, improved an improved situation for insurgents in terms of supplies, uh, uh, recruitment, and so forth. And I think this remains a huge question in the current situation mm -hmm. is to what extent is uh, our fighters on the ground able to replenish because they're certainly losing uh, members. Uh, uh, and we see in a number of instances, different groups have also handed themselves over, particularly uh, uh, around their challenges of, of securing food and so forth. And we have over the last year and a half uh, seen a number of groups uh, reportedly handing themselves uh, uh, over, although we have uh, no idea what's happened to those individuals. Uh, uh, since then, uh, this is part of the kind of uh, blackout that we have from the government in terms of, of, of information about the, the conflict itself. So it, the Islamic State issue, I think, is not one to be ignored. They certainly have saddled up uh, on, on this local insurgency. There is a greater ideological coherence, uh, and uh, uh, we see uh, a real prospect. I mean, Mozambique is an important... Uh, arena for propaganda uh, for Islamic State, and they're certainly uh, uh, pushing that for all it's worth. However, uh, developing along the other uh, 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 the line along the lines of other IS franchises, uh, it's extremely difficult for for them to do so in the in the absence of uh, control over a particular geographical area of territory. What we're expecting uh, this year is much of the same in terms of what's going on: a continued consolidation of certain areas of the province, uh, uh, which uh, uh, privileges uh, economic interests and a continuing low intensity conflict in other areas, uh, main areas of, of the, the main districts that, that, that continue to be affected. Uh, and that will be Makomia, Maluko, uh, Nangadi and Mwidumbi in particular. Now that does not prescribe uh, the insurgents making attacks outside of those areas and we're likely to see raids into uh, 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 other districts. Uh, and of course, we'll get a better idea of, of what their capacity is after the rains have finished when we tend to see uh, larger attacks. The, the rains have been late there, but this is going to curb a certain number of activities uh, of insertion. Although, uh, you know, we saw in the first half of, of January uh, a downtick in, in, in action, but then uh, in the wake of, of a current uh, major uh, Mozambican security operation with Salmon, uh, Operation uh, Volcao 4, uh, uh, that has been going on since the beginning of last month, we've seen a dispersal of insurgents, both east and west, north and south, uh, and uh, various attacks taking place, but also some interesting dynamics with insurgents being much more constructive uh, in their interactions with local communities purchasing food, handing out money to old people, and, and uh, not simply going through the uh, route of terrorizing uh, communities that we've seen uh, from some groups in some areas. And of course, the attacks uh, uh, against uh, uh, Mozambican forces in particular, but also the surrogate proxy elements uh, that are in play, the Porcash local, the local militias uh, that are operating uh, in a number of areas. Uh, and more recently, since the end of last year, the resuscitated Aparama militia uh, that, that are also operating uh, uh, and, and have faced, we saw pictures today from Islamic State of, I think it's uh, 13 Naparamas that were executed uh, uh, by, uh, by insurgents in, in, the last, uh, in the last few days. So, so it's a fluid situation. The security situation varies from area to area. Uh, it does not lend to a hard security solution uh, in the short to medium term uh, or indeed the long term. Uh, but obviously, hard security is absolutely critical uh, uh, for laying the foundations for the uh, longer term uh, human security uh, objectives that, that relate to issues of dialogue and, and, and uh, rebuilding or building a social contract between uh, communities and government, which lies at the heart of the governance challenges uh, in, in, in the province. 
and, and also beyond the province. I think this is one of the issues that, you know, that there are many issues, challenges there that, that certainly are not uh, uh, unique to the Cabo Delgado uh, story. Uh, so, you know, for those that are saying that the security situation is, is, is improving, uh, I think uh, this needs to be qualified. Uh, it depends which part of the what, what part of the province we're talking about. I'll leave it there for the moment, uh, Chris. But happy to come in on any of those aspects or others. Thanks, Piers, uh, for that very detailed presentation that focuses on the security situation. A couple of things that stand out to me. The first one is that you seem to indicate that attempts to contain violent extremists has not worked. What we have seen in actual fact is a disbursement of these violent extremists into maybe other uh, provinces. We've also seen a, a narrative um, that has really taken root when we look at the security situation that seems to suggest that um, the Rwandan contingent has done significantly better than, say, their Samim counterparts. And this is notwithstanding issues of interoperability and uh, a lack of, um, let's say, direct cooperation from what we can see from the outside. This is, this is um, sort of given. But my question to you and uh, peers, uh, this question really arises from something that was said to me by someone who is uh, known to both you and I, who is also a security uh, sort of specialist. And he argues that we, we have arrived at a culminating point uh, in terms of the security situation in Mozambique, basically meaning that the uh, sort of positive benefits of a military intervention will continually experience diminishing returns. Do you agree with this? And if you do agree with it, then it, it means that we're most likely not to get any sort of long-term positive outcomes from a, this preoccupation with the security situation or a security si a solution. Long question, but I know what you know what I mean, right? Yeah, thanks, Chris. I mean, I, I, I think uh, uh, I, I'm not sure I would agree with that we're at that point at this stage. I think much depends, much more could be done on the hard security front. Uh, I think the big challenge is, is, is the sustainability of, of the forces that are in play at the moment. Whether the, Ru the, Ru the Rwandans uh, uh, have recently expanded their force, uh, how they are able to sustain that in a context where we know that they are, have been looking for money and putting pressure on the Mozambican government to find additional money. The, the EU has uh, thrown them uh, 20 million euros uh, for non-lethal support. Uh, I don't know if that money is in place now, but that's not going to address their long-term sustainability issues. And of course, that feeds into questions about how this operation is being uh, is being funded and what kind of compensation Mozambique is going to have to cop up to, to the Rwandans. And what is the long-term uh, uh, role there? Salmon is operating on kind of half rations. There's now about 1,900 uh, uh, personnel in place, and we're going to see a few uh, hundred or so specialist Tanzanian police being deployed, hopefully to help to try and strengthen security a little on that very long, porous border on the north there, which is a major uh, concern. Uh, but I do think uh, from a hard security uh, context, and this is why you see at the SADC summit, the calls continually coming for, for uh, member states to contribute further, because you know South Africa uh, is carrying the bulk of the, the, the costs here, although obviously we're seeing uh, uh, other countries, TCCs, troop contributing countries, supporting themselves, Botswana, Tanzania, and so forth. But if you do not have the appropriate assets to actually maximize your options on the hard security front, uh, then yes, this is, this, this is going to uh, uh, do little more than contain certain areas. Uh, so I, I do think that there is an option uh, with available, if available resources is, are there. And I think this has a lot to do with uh, developing uh, the aerial capacity, 
consolidating coastal maritime uh, security options and so forth that you really do need to lock down as much as possible uh, also uh, in, in, let me add to that mix because i think it's a long-term security challenge is how to deal with proxies and auxiliaries if especially if you're going to try and move from a peace enforcement to a peace building approach, which is this shift from scenario six to scenario five in the AU lexicon, which is going to be about rebuilding pillars of state, which includes policing and the criminal justice system and so forth. And these issues seem to be light years away uh, uh, from, from, from the thinking uh, of most actors. You can hear me now. Great. I think one, one, one of the, the, the challenges that I have with the, the perspective that you are painting is if we imagine this scenario, let's imagine that Samim um, had all the capacity and all the requirements and all the needs fulfilled that it wanted. Do you still believe that the military solution would result in the kind of positive outcomes that we, we, we want? Uh, given what has been discussed here about the real grievances and the, and the real drivers of the extremists oh. um, that, that, that we see up north in Cabo Delgado. Do, do you that's really that's believe that a military solution can result in no, uh, and, a and, solution that is long-term, that is sustainable, notwithstanding no, no, I, the difficulties I, around... I'm, I'm, I'm not saying that, Chris. ...and, and, and supply chain that, that you have uh, sort of painted today. Yeah, no, I'm not saying that, that, that there is a long-term sustainable military solution here. But what I am saying is that a consolidation, a strengthening of, of, of the military uh, operation, and, and this requires an effective strategy that is tied to the human security uh, aspects. And I'm, I'll come back to Sam in there as well, because they appear to be the only ones that have at least had a little nudge down that route. But, but what I'm saying is that the hard security consolidation provides a stronger platform for those longer term sustainable human security uh, dynamics. What I'm saying is we have, we need to, to, to see that aspect being built. Uh, that's why I don't agree that we've reached the end of the road with the hard security options. It, th these are not either or options. It's about the interoperability of these issues. It's about how they feed, support and build one another. Salmon did get a small amount of money through uh, AU channels from uh, AU channels from the European Union last year to pilot uh, uh, peace building operations, which it presented its findings in September last year. It's a unclear how uh, uh, that project or that program is going to be developed further by SADA and Samin, and what resources will be brought to the fore there. But importantly, how will that tie in to other strategies and similar interests that uh, and policy uh, 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 policy, uh, policy developments that we see coming from uh, Mozambique, at least uh, in, in terms of its 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 uh, policies that we see from from the uh, uh, the aid in strategy and so forth. And I think this has to include issues relating to to Rwanda again an unknown quantity in this uh, situation. We've seen them being promoted, and I think there's a lot to learn from how Rwanda has engaged local communities and has built community trust, for example. How can those lessons uh, be integrated with the work of other uh, uh, security actors at the table, but also to bring in and to build uh, 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 local uh, uh, and inclusive uh, contributions from the people of Cabo Delgado. And I think the problem is we have a very fragmented approach around all these issues, which undermines uh, the longer term potential of A, having a consolidated clear strategy that they can all get behind. But I do think this is undermined by a hard security uh, approach, which is uh, not fit for purpose and is feeding uh, uh, into what many analysts have called a, a kind of green zone strategy where there is a uh, preference uh, in terms of security allocations and, and development attention to certain parts of the province and other parts of the province are kind of left to uh, uh, left to wallow in this low intensity conflict. Thanks, Piers, for, for, for your contribution. 
I'm cognizant of the time and I, I think uh, we're going to be wrapping up now. I'm going to ask really um, our, our panelists, excluding Prof. Adriano, who will um, give a vote of thanks and, and sort of wrap it all up for us, to really in two minutes give us uh, an assessment, a summary of um, what, what you have taken out, the key takeouts of our discussion today. Let me start off with uh, Prof. Antoni. As Piers spoke, I was thinking of Afghanistan. <laughs> what is the lesson of Afghanistan for us? Right? Number one. Number two, I'm, I'm a South African. I know what our security sector is capable of, can do and cannot do. Our threat environment has become very complex. Not only do we have to deploy internally to support police in crime prevention and uh, others emergency, we'll have a, a state of national disaster perhaps in five days in South Africa. Eswatini is burning. We're holding thumbs that, that Lesotho will stabilize. Zimbabwe is going through an election in coming weeks, months. You know that story better. We are deployed in the Eastern DRC and we haven't raised the links between Cabo Delgado and what's happening with the M23 in the Eastern DRC, the Great Lakes region, if you want. It's a complex arena. We are there. And then also we have to deploy, we have to carry some of them in terms of numbers. So I know that is not the solution either. Um, I come to one grand conclusion. <laughs> if we expect the governments and the states of the region to beef up Samim in whatever form, asking help from wherever, we might become deeper in, in, in drawn into an imbroglio, a Vietnam type situation and not forgetting what the kenyans have learned that very bitter lesson is you go across the border to protect your interests there they attack your soft underbelly at home we haven't even mentioned that we, let's give space for sadek to do their best to help stabilize the situation in cabo delgado in the meantime i believe the time has arrived for the non-state sector, for civil society, activists, NGOs, academia, think tanks, intellectuals in the region to come together under a very broad umbrella to address the following issues. Where are we with democracy in the region? Where are we with good governance in the region? I'm not now isolating Mozambique. I, I might as well talk about South Africa. Where are we with democracy and development where are we with good governance? And what is going on with unhealthy civil military relations in our region? And I think it's time for, for civil society leaders to pick up that baton. I'm looking here at some of your um, distinguished guests in the audience and run with this initiative. Because this might just, Chair, give us the counterpoint to, to the very bitter disappointment that we have that some members not going to deliver. Excellent. Um, yeah. Maybe we can go to uh, Professor Joao, your final uh, remarks in maybe two minutes, please. A solution uh, is important to provide security to population, is important to create some, um, some stabilization. Um, but this is a problem of development. This is a problem of social inclusion. Um, this is a problem of rebuild uh, a country in terms of providing services that without them, we are running fast to a failure state. I mean, uh, services related to access of justice, um, access of, of course, education, uh, health, but in terms of quality, um, to social, create social participation channels and imagine a new model of economical development uh, that provide jobs uh, for agriculture, for fisheries, for informal trader, for some uh, rural 
for, for some transformation of um, agricultural pr products. Uh, but uh, it means that uh, the government uh, makes a, a debate. Uh, it's related with, go with good governance, it's related with the fight against corruption, to, to relate to strength the state uh, institutions. Um, but um, a few, very few things, very few people are talking about this uh, in Mozambique. The, the main debate is on fight against the, the terrorists. Um, well, and uh, I am not optimistic for the for the few future for, for the next future. Uh, but uh, I hope uh, uh, I hope that in five years, um, uh, uh, my friend Adriano Novunga invite me again to come uh, to um, to a webinar again, and then I recognize five years ago I was wrong. I hope it will happen, but. It's quite apparent is that there isn't a single solution uh, that will result in a cessation of hostilities in Mozambique. What we really need to move towards is a situation where the various parties, be they in government, in the civil society, the local communities, begin to engage each other in some sort of a dialogue that results in a situation where the real grievances of the communities on the ground begin to become resolved. I'm certainly not just depressed or discouraged by the situation that we see unfolding in Cabo Delgado, but what in actual fact I, I feel is a sense of encouragement that those in civil society, as was advocated by uh, Professor Antoni, those in sectors who work on the ground need now more than ever to become active, to show leadership, and to become engaged in processes that can result in a sustainable solution to the conflict that we've seen up north in Cabo Delgado. So for those of you joining us uh, online, I just want to say thank you for joining us. And over to you, Professor Adriano. Um, very informative uh, discussion, informative also. Um, but hey, Mozambique is the is the one of the very first uh, countries in the world um, where that nation is facing a violent extremism, uh, but it remains faceless for five years. It remains faceless for five years. Uh, in each and every country where um, uh, that particular society is, fighting, is facing violent extremism, the people of that country, they know. I, I hear you in saying there is uh, um, capacity in the global south to properly uh, research, document, um, challenges and come with uh, solutions in terms of suggestion how to go about those. But as a matter of fact, um, we don't have a granular understanding as to who these people are in Cabo Delgado. Uh, what are they for? 
what is it are they against the state who these people are we we don't have a granular understanding of who those people are so to hear that we we are making progress well we are making progress against something that you don't understand what it is you know so how do you measure that progress because you at the beginning you don't have understanding what that thing it is so um i hear you agree um we need to move away from uh, prescribed kind of uh, 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 policy solutions which are not properly informed by granular knowledge this is one important uh, takeaway uh, for me of all this discussion um uh, secondly uh, we talk about stabilization of cabo delgado um we we mentioned that the rwandis are doing better compared to samim of course i mean i see the uh, rwandan troops they are better equipped eh? their equipment they are, you look at them they are tight uh, everything uh, it is it is proper um, um uh, the samim they are relatively better but if you come down to my fellow uh, countrymen girls and boys that have joined the army to protect our sovereignty to protect our independence our country our interests they are not properly fed at the beginning they had one or two meals but i doubt whether today they are certain that they will have a single meal in cabo delgado let alone that they will have a salary at the end of the month but it's not only the situation with the army whole civil servant in mozambique they did not ha have the 13th check at the end of the year which is is sacrosanct it, it, they haven't received the check uh, teachers are not paid um so we have a, we have signs of a failing uh, government not only um, in addressing the challenges in cabo delgado but the, the state machinery uh, is not functional in the country M maputo is beautiful my, my colleagues uh, we have police everywhere but this police are here because the the political uh, establishment is here in maputo but you don't have this in the districts of Cabo Delgado. You don't have this in the district of the Northern Mozambique. So the, the, the state is not there to perform the basic functions to meet what you have said, the, uh, the rights. Let's take the state from a rights perspective. It is not there. So when you say uh, we are stabilizing Cabo Delgado, it's against what measure? Uh, against what? unless that means stabilizing capital gadu for the international private sector to be able to operate and in fact uh, i hear that um, contracts are being uh, reviewed to uh, include security um, costs that means again taking away the much needed capacity for mozambique to be able to address some of these so um uh, dialogue is important um but there is a much broader dialogue that the nation needs to engage into as a nation as a nation um and then uh, zoom into to cabo delgado um a dialogue in cabo delgado um unless Cabo Delgado is a small island but if Cabo Delgado is a part of this nation then there is a need for much broader we have talked about the the peace dividend which in Maputo is felt here yeah, uh, you, you are driving into nice roads airport is not o o operating properly but there's an airport it's nice but when you go to Cabo Delgado airport it's a small thing like this 
Cabo Delgado, Pemba, it is the third biggest world bay in the world. My friend, that on its own, it's a world. But Cabo Delgado Airport is, is, is like a district airport. It does not speak to the enormous potential that Cabo Delgado is. So governance is failing the nation. Governance is failing the people of Cabo Delgado. It's governance that is uh, giving room for the violent extremism to, um, to expand the way that has been able to uh, expand. So um, my, um, uh, my message is a, a need for a, an inclusive, John has said that, an inclusive, but a much broader spectrum uh, dialogue, nation uh, level, uh, and then we can zoom in to, to Cabo Delgado. But there is that need for an overall conversation as a nation bringing uh, all forces. But today, the government is passing a legislation to stop the civic space for uh, civil society to operate. Uh, the much needed organizations to to um, to, to, to come in um, um, in a more to, to bring communities, bring the community perspectives, but uh, that space is being closed. Um, so we will see that government is sticking to a militaristic uh, approach uh, without a proper um, strategy to prepare um, and set governance governance right for the Mozambican army. Uh, you can train uh, one million men and women, but if governance is not set right, right uh, that will not take you into uh, a stability in the region. So I would like to uh, thank you all uh, for this opportunity today. This is one of a series of conversations at the various levels um, with the aim of bringing uh, all stakeholders um, bringing um, all voices uh, to be heard and uh, empowering voices to be able, empowering voices to be able to speak, um, um, but to be able to speak uh, and to be able to speak from their own perspective. Uh, how do they see Cabo Delgado evolving and the opportunities of the, gov the, the local people uh, being part of the government take? Because let us not forget that Cabo Delgado will generate a bigger take for the government. But how much of that take will, uh, will benefit local communities, local, local communities? How much of that? So all these conversations need to um, uh, occur in a, in a structured and organized manner and then generate something that you called as a national uh, action plan, um, which is informed by local local perspectives, uh, but at the moment um, policies are informed by uh, state-centric um, uh, perspectives and hence non properly inclusive and not properly legitimate. Today it is Thursday. Uh, tomorrow it's a public holiday here. It is the Heroes Day, and we hope that tomorrow in the celebrations, uh, the political leadership can come up with uh, uh, ideas that can uh, drive this nation into sustainable solution, not only to Cabo Delgado, but to the bigger challenges of the nation so that uh, Mozambique can harness the potential and play the role, catalytic role in the region. Thank you very much, uh, GGA. Thank you very much, Melan Guardian. To all uh, our participants, Professor, from the Mbeki uh, Institute. I would like to thank you all for this um, informative and informative conversation today. To the team, thank you, thank you very much. And we look forward to further discussion. Thank you very much. Thank you.